Isis, man. Dionysus was like never a dull moment. He literally exploded into existence after his mother Semele burst into pieces when Zeus showed her his true form because he was tricked by Hera as a whole thing. Then Zeus continued the gestation period by carrying him in his thigh. Ever since then, he took on the responsibility of being god of fertility, wine, wine making and madness. So essentially the party god, the frat boy of Olympus. However, some say that Dionysus was a result of a union between Zeus and Persephone, which is like even more confusing, but hey, it's what it's a myth. So let's go. But the most famous story about him revolves around the back eye and the story interpreted by Euripides. Pentheus, the king of Thebes, banished the worship of Dionysus and forbade the women of the kingdom from participating in the Bacchus. You can bet frat boy wasn't happy about this. He doesn't like being banned. He cast a spell of madness on all the women of the kingdom to attend the festival. So Pentheus caught him somehow and imprisoned him, but you can't chain a god. Dionysus decided on his revenge. He transformed into an irresistibly beautiful woman and lured Pentheus to spy on the Bacchic rituals. When the Maenads spotted him, they thought he was a wild dog, peeping Tom more like, so they tore him limb from limb. One of the attackers was his mother, Agave, who didn't know the animal was actually her son in the madness that she was wrapped up in. So. Yeah, there are plenty more stories regarding this rascal, but this will have to wait for part three. Number nine, Lysurgus. We talked about Mira in part one, you know, the woman who slept with her father and then turned into a tree from which she gave birth. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch part one right now. Yeah, weird times. Well, here is another plant story that's equally as confusing. I know branches can sometimes look like arms, but how do you confuse your son for one? Uh, well, Dionysus has to be involved. Lysurgus attacked and injured the aforementioned party god, Dionysus, and needless to say, the gods were not happy about it. Dionysus was basically doing a pub crawl with wine in the mortal realm, and Lysurgus wasn't jazzed about it because he was a messy dude. As punishment, Dionysus Dionysus descended upon him with madness. In this violent state, Lysurgus saw a pile of weeds that he just had to get out of his garden, so he took an axe and chopped them away. Little did he know that it was actually his very own son that he was chopping to pieces. He also took the life of the rest of his family, and he even took off his own legs in his madness. After he finally passed away, he was entombed in a rock as a sign of disrespect for offending the gods. So moral of the story, don't whine about the man of the vine who likes to party all the time. Don't do it. Number eight, Hera the Virgin. The most confusing thing in all of Greek mythology was Hera and Zeus's marriage. Sometimes you just gotta know when it's time to call it quits. Between them being siblings, Zeus cheating on her all the time, Hera killing people over jealousy and spite, things were just messy. But did you know that Hera actually grew back her virginity annually? Not at all possible to rebuild that in real life, but if you're a god, then anything is possible. Hera was the goddess of virginity and was worshipped as the goddess of matrimony, virginity, and marriage. Though she was married, albeit unhappily, she was revered as a virgin, which clearly she wasn't. So in order to maintain this, she renewed her virginity every year by bathing in the spring of Canathus. The rites performed in order to do this were kept a secret and never spoken of, but she did it. This meant that people could still revere her for it and she could pretend for a moment that Zeus and her never got jiggy with it because obviously she'd, she'd want to forget that. After all, being a faithful wife to an unfaithful husband doesn't sound like a grand old time if you ask me. Number seven, Skyron. I don't know about you, but if someone washed my feet for me, the first thing I would do would say, thank you, full stop, like that's it. The last thing I would do is blast them off a cliff with said clean toesies. Already there are a few things I never thought I would say to thousands of people. <laughs> but what a great intro to the story of Skyron. Skyron was a bandit who was obsessed with killing people after and while they washed his feet. Everybody's got their thing, I guess. He would call travelers on the road to help him wash his feet, which a surprising amount of people agreed to do, right? Imagine someone asking you to do that today. You just hear a voice pleading from a dark alley to like, please wash my feet, wash my feet. I need someone to wash my feet. Would you go? Serious question. Anyways, when these extremely kind people would offer help, he would kick them in the face and push them over a cliff. Yeah. To add insult to injury, at the base of the cliff was a man eating tortoise who would eat the remains of the either dead or still alive people. 
Talk about kicking a man while they're down. He got away with this too many times. <laughs> Imagine the parents having to warn their kids not to wash random people's feet. Thankfully, Theseus, Poseidon's son, butted in and threw him off the very cliff he so enjoyed in his pastime. I like how the crime fits the punishment here. You know? It's satisfying. I like it. It's good, good storytelling. Number six, Tyrius, Procne, and Philomela. Okay, this one is probably the most messed up out of all the Greek tales, at least in my book. Trigger warnings galore here, folks. I'll try to be delicate. Tereus was the son of Ares and the king of Thrace. He married Procne, who was the eldest daughter of Pandion, the king of Athens. The two fell fast in love, but the Furies prepared their marriage bed and howled all night over their union. A very, very bad omen. Soon Procne longed for her little sister Philomela to join her, so Tereus went to fetch her from Athens. But as soon as he saw her, he was consumed by lust. Despite promising her father he'd protect her, he stole Philomela away and ravaged her. She promised she'd tell everyone what he did. So in order to stop that from happening, he cut out her tongue. He hid her away and told Procne that she'd been lost at sea and perished. For a year, Philomela snuck cloth from the maid that would care for her and wove a tapestry that told her story. The maid secretly brought the cloth to Procne and she immediately sought out her sister. Fueled by rage, she took her revenge. She stole the life of their own son, Itis, and fed him to Tereus for dinner. When he called for him, Procne revealed her sister and pointed to the stew that the king had finished. Tereus flew into a rage and gave chase, but the two women changed into birds to evade him. Birds. Okay. Procne turned into a swallow, Philomela a nightingale, and Tereus soon followed suit by the ravenous Hoopoo -hoo bird. Would have thought it would be like a raven or like a hawk, but nope, he got the Hoopoo -hoo bird. Okay. Number five, Circe and the pigs. Circe wasn't so much considered a, as much a goddess, though she was one, more like a witch or an enchantress. She was the daughter of Helios, and depending on your sources, she was also the daughter of Hecate. This story is confusing because no one can really define whether she was the villain of the story or just like sad and lonely. The story goes as follows. The great hero, Odysseus, and his crew after months at sea happen upon her island. He sends his men ashore to investigate and find a cottage surrounded by magnificent magnificent yet docile beasts. Circe is heard singing and when the men greet her she invites them in for a hearty meal and after months at sea, that's, that's amazing. Unbeknownst to them though, the food is enchanted and the men all turn into pigs. Odysseus discovers this and after Hermes places a protective charm on him, he confronts her. Her charms were powerless on him because of Hermes so she invited him into bed instead. Yeah, sure, why not? This is also out of character for Odysseus because he was super in love with his wife back home, but I guess he couldn't say no because she was a goddess, and hey, sexy times. Circe realizes who he was, and having been foretold that Odysseus would be the only man to resist her, she lifted the curse on the men. She also made them hotter in the process, as a, like, I'm really sorry. And then they all stayed for a year, because I guess, why not? They just stayed for a year. I don't know why. When they decided to finally leave, Cersei ended up giving him a bunch of info to protect him, so I guess like she turned into a friend after all. And I, yeah, it's just weird. Why would you stay on an island that turned you into pigs? I don't know. I don't know. Do you? Number four, Hercules holds a giant off the ground. The taller you stand, the farther you have to fall. A lesson the tall people of the world will understand. As a requirement for the 12 trials of Hercules, our great hero had to defeat a massive giant. This ginormous form was named Antaeus, an undefeatable immortal so long as his feet remained on the ground. His mother was Gaia, the goddess of the earth, so like all his powers came from her. Duh. Antaeus was a big fan of wrestling, he loved it, and Hercules was a big strong guy, so they went at it. But in order to defeat him, all Hercules had to do was lift him off the ground and wait until his power drained from him. And that was that, because if he threw him on the ground, he would just like regenerate. So that sounds more like a prolonged piggyback than wrestling, but you know, whatever gets the job done. Good for you, buddy. And coming up to our top three, we have number three, Procrustes. Theseus dealt with a lot of interesting characters and Procrustes was exactly how his name sounds. 
crusty. If you ever find yourself wrapped up in a scheme designed to enforce uniformity by violent methods, then you may use the term Procrustean bed to adequately describe it. Procrustes was a serial taker of lives who had a very special bed. He would, like Skyron, soothe very weary travelers into a false sense of security by offering them a bed to stay for in the night. However, if you didn't fit on the bed, which no one did, he would either violently stretch you or trim you to put it delicately so that you would fit the bed. Obviously, all the travelers ended up dead. The notorious criminal lived between Athens and Ulysses, so coming across travelers was pretty easy. It was just a matter of time before Theseus would encounter him and set the record straight. Having heard of his crimes, Theseus decided to turn the tables and make Procrustes fit his own bed. So, what's even more confusing about this story is that Procrustes was the son of Poseidon, and so technically was Theseus' brother, so in a way, Theseus kind of committed fratricide, but Procrustes wasn't really behaving with godlike intentions, so I'm not sure where you can draw the line there. Number two, Tantalus and Pelops. This one. Considering Tantalus was in such good rapport with the gods, I'm not sure why he did this. As we know, being on the gods' bad side even slightly leads to some pretty harsh punishment, so imagine really being on their bad side. Tantalus was the king of the land that is now Turkey today, and the gods thought he was just swell. So great, they'd even visit him from time to time for dinner. That sounds pretty good, man. Maybe they were awful dinner guests or something, but eventually Tantalus wanted to see how far he could push his luck. He devised a test that would determine whether the gods were all knowing. He could have been like, how many fingers do I have behind my back? He could have been like, uh, how many apples are in my dungeon? He, he could have done something random like that, but instead he did the last thing you would think of. Tantalus killed his son Pelops, cooked him up and served him for dinner. Of course, the gods were wise to it as soon as they sat down, and considering a father eating his children was a pretty sensitive topic, Kronos, they were not pleased. The only god who ate some of Pelops was Demeter, who was blinded by grief over the loss of her daughter Persephone because she was downstairs with Hades. Needless to say, they were pissed. Zeus threw Tantalus into the abyss of Tartarus to endure an eternity of torment. His punishment was to spend the rest of time waist deep in water with a fruit tree hanging above him. Each time he went to take a drink, the water receded, and every time he went to take a bite of the fruit, the wind would blow it off course. However, as soon as he stopped lunging for it, everything would return back to normal and tempt him even further. Happy ending for Pelops though, since Demeter ate part of him, they brought him back to life and he was turned into ivory. Pretty good. Pretty good for him. Number one, Endymion. This story isn't exactly linear, so it remains one of the most confusing tales because it was likely pieced together. The issue for historians is that no complete story exists of it today, but we know it's about the love between the goddess of the moon, Selene, and a human man. In some versions, he was the son of Thelius. Others say he was raised by him, but was actually the son of Zeus. Some say he was a shepherd, others a king, but either way, this guy spent a lot of time outside at night beneath the moon. Sometimes he would even stay up all night charting the path of the moon, ignoring the desire to sleep. Soon Selene fell deeply in love with Endymion, a strikingly handsome mortal man. Selene could no longer ignore her desire and decided to visit her love, abandoning the sky altogether. Softly, gently, she crept up upon him to avoid frightening him, but the two were swept away by the throes of love, but her adoration distracted her from her duties. In addition to that, Endymion was mortal, meaning their love would be short-lived in his mortal life. So Zeus, either for punishment or pity of Selene, put her lover into a deep, frozen sleep so that she may always see her love as a young man. But little more is known, actually, if that was punishment or pity. But hey, it's kind of beautiful. At number 10, spicy defense. Usually when you think about wars from ancient times, you think of swords, spears, bows, and arrows as being the primary weapons used to fight, but that wasn't entirely the case with the ancient Greeks. It turns out that their warfare was a lot more advanced than you'd think. The ancient Greeks were actually known to have used chemical warfare as part of their defense. They were known to use poison-tipped arrows and incendiary weapons. The 
the earliest example of such a thing in ancient Greece comes from the siege of Plataea in 429 BC, when Spartan soldiers set fire to a wood pile with sulfur, releasing sulfur dioxide gas into the air and forcing the opposing force to flee their positions. According to other accounts, they may have also poisoned the water supply. The most famous case of chemical warfare from the Greeks, however, comes from the Byzantine Greeks when they invented a petroleum based substance that couldn't be extinguished with water and would be fired from tubes that were attached to Greek ships. What's so cool about that is the fact that no one has ever been able to recreate it. At number 9, hashtag roasted. I'm sure you've no doubt heard of the messed up punishment devices that have been used throughout history. I have to say that the people of the past were very creative when it came to coming up with ways to bring harm to others, and the ancient Greeks were no exception. I mean, they certainly weren't the worst when it came to their punishments, but they still were going a little overboard. One of their famously horrific torture devices was called the brazen bull. It was a large hollow casting of a bull made from bronze that had a door installed into the side of it. When someone was up for punishment via the the brazen bull, they would be stuffed inside the statue, the door would be closed on them, and a fire would be lit under the bull, heating the metal statue. The person inside would then be sadly roasted alive. I would much rather be roasted on Twitter than inside this mighty metal bull, that's for sure. And number eight, questionable relationships. The ancient Greeks had some pretty questionable habits when it came to the coming of age of young Greeks. The idea of a relationship between an older person and one who has not yet come of age was not only normal, but was encouraged. As part of the coming of age of young Greek boys, they would be part of a ritualistic kidnapping. Now, Don't worry, they weren't actually being taken from their beds in the middle of the night. This was more so an agreement made by the boy's father ahead of time, but either way, they would still be taken by an older person from the community, where they would be taken out into the wilderness and taught how to hunt, they would feast, and they would learn how to be an adult. They would later return to the community where they would be given a choice of either severing ties with their adult partner or continuing their relationship with them. It's certainly a little unsettling the fact that this kind of thing was normal. At number 7, backwards logic. It was tough being a woman in ancient Greece. I mean, it's been tough being a woman at any time throughout history and we're still fighting for our place in society on many fronts, but back in the times of ancient Greece, they had it really bad. Part of Greek society included the notion that women were objects and as a result, the Greek Greeks saw adultery as a worse crime than non-consensual relations. Now you're probably scratching your head thinking, why? And my dear viewer, I will tell you why they had this sort of backwards logic. You see, since women were considered to be objects and property, any kind of misconduct or mistreatment to a woman, especially one's spouse, this was considered to be almost like theft of this object, and so if found guilty, the person responsible for this injustice would be tried for adultery, not the real crime at hand, being the mistreatment of a woman. The punishment for an adulterer was quite severe as when caught, they could risk being killed on the spot and in the event of whatever affair, that would be grounds for an immediate divorce. At number 6, deformed males. Further on the topic of the presence of women in ancient Greek society, let's talk about how women were seen in their communities. Now even though Aristotle was considered to be one of the greatest philosophers in history, his ideas were also quite flawed. During his life, he believed that women were deformed males who were created when, quote, something went wrong in their mother's wombs. End quote. They considered women to be so terrible that the philosopher Plato also warned men against being reincarnated as a woman in the next life, saying that this could be avoided if they had lots of success during their current lifetime. Because of this view on women, baby girls were often abandoned, girls' education focused primarily on how to have and raise a family, and when girls were married off, they were considered to be property like I mentioned in the previous number. At number 5, democracy? Though the Greeks are often credited with the creation of democracy, much like anything else in this world, it has a dark history, one of injustice and bloodshed. Back in the days of ancient Greece and in the relatively early days of democracy, this political practice could sometimes be used for nefarious purposes. One of the best examples of that comes from the Mytilian debate of 427 BC. Basically what happened here is that during the Peloponnesian War, the city state of Mytilene tried to free itself from the influence of Athens. Athens. Their revolt ultimately failed, and the citizens of the city state were subjected to a severe punishment. They decided to not only execute the prisoners that they'd taken to Athens, but also the entire adult male population, and women and children were sold into slavery. The vote to put a stop to Mytilene weighed heavily on the minds of those who voted for this outcome, so they later staged another vote, ultimately choosing to only punish those who were directly involved in the city's revolt. At number four, crime and punishment. Earlier, I mentioned.
been one of the gruesome ways that people were punished in ancient Greece, but let me tell you some more about their ways of crime and punishment. The standard form of executing prisoners was by performing what was called a bloodless crucifixion. Basically, the convicted individual would quote, be fastened to a board by the wrists and ankles and a collar around the neck would be tightened gradually to strangle them to death. End quote. If an execution had to take place on a battlefield, the accused would be beheaded, but if given the option, you could sometimes avoid a violent death by instead choosing to ingest poison on your own terms. If you committed a crime and were able to avoid execution, then you would be exiled. If your crime was bad enough to be banished from your community, then your name and crime would be inscribed somewhere so that no one forgot what you did, meaning that your crime would be known for the rest of time. At number three, this is Sparta. As you could imagine, childhood during ancient times was certainly no easy cakewalk, but one of the worst upbringings in ancient Greece had to go to the young citizens of Sparta. Just to give you an idea of how life might have been as a Spartan, just think about the fact that it was literally written into law that Spartans had to be quote, fearless, ruthless, and disciplined above all else. End quote. Back then, a young Spartan boy would only grow up with his parents until he was seven years old, which at this point, he would then be sent to a military camp run by the state, where he would stay until he turned 30. Young Spartans were taught mostly about fighting, perfecting the art of combat, and would spend very little time learning math and music. These kids were taught to be ruthless, stealing for their survival, and not showing any fear towards their enemies. At number two, ostracism. In Athens, back during ancient Greece, ostracism was a common aspect of political life. Back then, the citizens would evaluate the performance of their politicians. They would then vote on who didn't serve them well or who they didn't like, and the citizens would write the name of said person on a piece of broken pottery. The person who gained the most votes from the public would then be exiled from Athens for 10 years. Unfortunately, this was kind of a flawed system, and any clever politician would then be able to use this ostracism vote in order to get rid of their rival. After Athenian figured out the flaw in their system, their ostracism votes were later ended. And finally, at number one, sacrifice. At this point, after learning about so many ancient civilizations, I think it's safe to assume that basically every civilization had their sacrifices. Human sacrifices, I mean. It's been theorized that perhaps the ancient Greeks were participating in such practices because back in 2016, the remains of a teenager were found on Mount Lycaon, which appeared to have been, quote, a product of ritual sacrifice, end quote. It is thought that perhaps this person was meant to serve as a sacrifice to the god Zeus. On top of that, there have also been pieces of ancient literature that depicts the sacrificing individuals in the same area that those remains were found. We don't know for certain if this kind of ritual was part of everyday life or if it was just a one-off type deal. Number 10, Clash of the Titans. An Avengers level threat, baby. The Titans were the big bad giants who ruled over the earth and the gods. Naturally, they all got along and there were never any problems, ever. <laughs> Yeah, right. They fought like cats and dogs, though I never understood that because all the dogs and cats I know always got along great. But the Titans fought, and, and they fought some more, until your favorite boy Zeus had enough and kind of took control over everything. It's Zeus, it's what he does. It's too bad Aaron Yeager wasn't there to help out. Number nine, Prometheus. Poor Prometheus. This is my favorite tale from Greek mythology. I think it's rather sad for Prometheus. All he wanted to do was give us the knowledge of fire. And, and look at all the things that we did with it. Forged iron and steel, heated our homes, so no one would ever go cold again. And we cooked, which gave Gordon Ramsay 23 hit shows and a reason to curse when asking for the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? Prometheus went directly against Zeus's orders, and if you didn't know, that's kind of a bad thing. It can wind you up in a rather unfortunate position. A position like being chained up and having a large bird come feast on your intestines. Like I eat mom's spaghetti. She makes a good spaghetti, thanks mom. You make a good spaghetti. Number eight, Icarus. I think we can all relate to this one, or at least have been told a version of this when we were flush. Things were going good for us. In a nutshell, Icarus got some wax wings and gained the ability to flight. Mind you, that was probably the dream of many ancient peoples. After Icarus got his wings, he got a little arrogant. He wanted to push his wings to the limit. Kind of like Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. But instead of falling in a multi-million dollar super suit and looking handsome while doing it, Icarus sniffed one too many of his own farts and flew too close to the sun where he burned up in it. So what's the lesson learned here, folks? Keep yourself grounded and don't sniff your own farts. Ha <laughs> ha!
<laughs> Number seven, Jason and the Argonauts. Avenger level threat acquired. For some reason in our lives, you find stories of our favorite heroes forming almighty and powerful groups. The Avengers, the Justice League, BTS. That one, that one might have too much power. But yes, Jason and the Argonauts were a band of heroes on adventures, slaying beasts, taking names, and Greekifying the area. Sadly, for Jason and the Argonauts, every time they try and make a movie about it, it just, uh, it just never works for them. I don't know. They had a visually impressive one in the 60s, and everything after that has just been a complete misfire. Hollywood, if your casting calls come my way, just, just know I make a great Jason. Look at me. I, I could be Jason. A sword, a shield. And there we go, that's it. Number six, Hercules. Hercules, Hercules, the strong one. Or the one where Danny DeVito coaches him through the process of being a Greek legend. If Danny DeVito is coaching you through anything, that probably means you're gonna come out on top. And yes, before you start typing in the comment section, technically speaking, Hercules is the Roman copy of Heracles. I know. However, it's kind of one of those things that everyone just knows the one. So anytime a Greek dude shows up with muscles, you blush and you think of Hercules. As far as Greek mythology goes, it doesn't get any more classic than a super strong guy with abs and biceps. And maybe a little bit of olive oil on, I don't know. Number five, Sisyphus. Oh baby, do I feel this one. Story of my life, honestly, day late and a dollar short. Some of you folks at home may also share the same fate as me and this chiseled Greek man doomed for eternity. This one is also one of my favorites. Basically, Sisyphus was cheating the devil. Cheating death itself, actually. After sliming his way out of the underworld one too many times, Big Daddy Zeus had to intervene. Also, when I say I relate to him, it's not because I'm a trickster who cheats my demise or cheats the, the devil or, or Hades. I'll explain. So, after Sisyphus had done what he'd done, Zeus sentenced him to roll a giant boulder up a hill for eternity. When he gets to the top, she rolls back down to the bottom and he has to start all over again. Every day for the rest of time. Not just life, for time. Sometimes in life it feels like you're on a grind and you work and work and work and sometimes you go right back to square one no matter how hard you work. That sucks and that can be exhausting. But never give up because Chetty ain't and neither should you. Number four, King Midas. The lesson in this one folks is to be careful what you wish for. King Midas was being granted a wish. He wished for anything I touch be turned to gold. Now I'm not an economist because I already have too many jobs on the internet but you can imagine how at today's rate of gold how wealthy you would be. Sheesh! Yeah, gold was valuable back then, but now, wow, we will. So his wish was granted, and everything he touched turned to gold, which, for a good couple hours, must have been the most fun anyone has ever had, ever. Dude was seeing drachma signs. However, this wealthy gift he had been given quickly turned into a curse or a burden. Everything he touched turned to gold. That included his food. Because of this, he starved. To fix this burden, he bathed in a river, and it said that's why gold can be found in that river. I wouldn't mind having that power myself, but if I made food gold, or even worse, what if I made my beer gold? Lahar, <laughs> Lahar. Number three, Narcissus. This one's in the name. Basically, there was a guy named Narcissus, and he was gorgeous. Like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Ryan Reynolds gorgeous. I'll just all put together. Oh. And he knew it, and he loved his image. Now, as a guy who goes on camera every day, naturally, you hate yourself. You hate your self-image. That's how it goes. Ask anyone here, they would tell you the same thing. But also, as someone who's on camera every day and funny from time to time, you kind of like yourself on camera, and you kind of like your self-image. It's a very strange relationship we have. However, no one is as bad as it comes to as narcissists. One day in the forest, he came across a body of water where he saw his reflection cast. And it was so handsome, so gorgeous, that he couldn't look away, ever. Hence the name Narcissist, or Narcissist. Or what most girls in high school find out what their boyfriends have, Narcissism. Ladies, let me know, have you ever dated someone who has Narcissism or looked in the mirror too long? Let me know, I'm curious. Number two, Medusa. I feel like a lot of people know this one. Medusa, the half beautiful lady, half head of snakes in her head and, and half monster thing with powers. Yes, I realize that was three halves and that doesn't add up, but you're talking to a guy who was voted class clown in the high school yearbook and not voted most likely to succeed in math. Cause I just wouldn't. But she was the Gorgon monster who would turn men into stone. I, I, I do know that. If they looked into her eyes. That was until your boy Perseus showed up like Link with a mirror shield and gave her a taste of her own medicine. What's the lesson on this one? I'm not sure. Maybe it's don't be so sure of your abilities. Maybe it's seeing things through 
Or maybe it's having an extensive knowledge of tactics from a late 90s Nintendo character. That you, you never know when you're gonna need that. You never know. I, I, I know that stuff. That can come in handy. Number one, Pandora's box. I know you guys know this one, but this one is so simple. At first glance, it's not about turning things into gold or weird snakehead ladies or giants rising from beneath the earth to fight each other. It's a box. Something ain't good in that box, but it's just a box. So don't open it. I'm gonna say it again because there's gonna be people in the comment section that are gonna say, but Chetty, because you said don't open it, that means I really wanna open it. Imagine I'm Robert De Niro telling you not to open it. Nope, no way. Nope, not gonna happen. Nope, null and void. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's how you know I'm serious because I did a bad impression. Oh great, somebody opened it. Yes, that's right, Pandora's box was opened and it said that all the evils of the world were released from the box. Good tale, good moral, but who the heck thought putting all those evil things in the world in the box was a great idea? Whatever happened to just having memento boxes? You know, you open up a thing, like this is the time I farted on camera, this is the time I went to the cottage, you know what I mean? Whatever happened to that? 